So uh, today is Saturday, uh, October 13th, 2018, and this is the first day of our uh, seven-day Jataka Session here at the Vermont Zen Center. And uh, it's actually our 10th annual Jataka Session. Woo-hoo! <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thinking of the many Jatakas we've explored over the last 10 years, how often did we find in them a surprisingly modern perspective? <coughs> Something that contemporary science is only now beginning to acknowledge. And in this, I'm referring to their recognition of the individual consciousness and personality of non-human beings. We've looked at jatakas in which the bodhisattva himself is an animal and found in such tales that he displayed not only conscious awareness and intelligence, but a clear ability to make complex and sensitive ethical and spiritual choices. Certainly the tale of the Banyan deer is one prime example of that. In that tale, if you remember, the Bodhisattva as a deer king offers his own life to save a pregnant doe and her unborn fawn, then refuses to accept freedom for himself and his herd until all the trapped deer, then all the animals, birds, and fish too, have been freed <coughs> from the king's hunt. Recognition of the ability of animals to think and make individual decisions as an insight into reality and not some wish, mere wish-fulfilling fairy tale uh, fantasy is gaining credence among scientists and behaviorists who are currently examining the lives of animals, birds, and fish, including octopi, which are actually a form of mollusk. In short, animals are being recognized as conscious beings with feelings, insights, temperaments, choices, and decision-making abilities that shatter generic cookie-cutter stereotypes. Just as the 2,500-year-old Jatakas have shown us all along, animals in these tales are not simply types, but are individuals with their own karma and life paths. In the West, such knowledge has been lost for centuries, leading to truly terrible abuses of our fellow beings. In this weekend portion of our 10th annual Jataka session, we'll take this insight into the unity of all life, a recognition that all beings are on the Mahayana, or Great Way, together a bit further. For we'll look into the inner, potentially bodhisattvic life of not just animals, but plants and trees. We'll start our journey, uh, not in India, but locally with a native view and with excerpts from the Iroquois Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address, or Words Before All Else. Iroquois <coughs> peoples recite this text at communal gatherings. It can be quite lengthy in its traditional forms, but I'll be reading from a shortened, modernized text created by John Stokes of the Tracking Project in New Mexico. So here's his introduction. These words of thanksgiving come to us from the native people known as the Haudenosaunee, also Iroquois or Six Nations, Mohawk, Oneida, Cayuga, Onondaga, Seneca, and Tuscarora of upstate New York and Canada. The Thanksgiving Address has ancient roots dating back over a thousand years to the formation of the Great Law of Peace by a man called the Peacemaker, and perhaps uh, before that. Today these words are still spoken at the gatherings, uh, at the opening and closing of all ceremonial and governmental gatherings held by the Six Nations. A speaker is chosen to give the Thanksgiving greetings on behalf of the people. They choose their own words, for we are all unique and have our own style, that the general form is traditional. It follows an order in which we can relate to all of the creation. The address is based on the belief that the world cannot be taken for granted, that a spiritual communication of thankfulness and acknowledgement of all living things must be given to align the minds and hearts of the people with nature. This forms a guiding principle of culture. 
We believe that all people at one time in their history had similar words to acknowledge the works of the Creator. With this in mind, we offer these words in a written form as a way to reacquaint ourselves with this shared vision. Our version of the Thanksgiving Address has been modified for a general audience, shortened, and many specific references to the culture of the Six Nations have been generalized. We hope this will enhance the accessibility of the words for readers around the world. It was Chief Jake Swamp's original vision that this address would go out to the children of the world so that, quote, later in life when they go out and meet one another, they will find that they are all coming from the same place. This booklet is printed in the Mohawk and English languages. Future editions are planned in Mohawk German, Mohawk Spanish, Mohawk Hawaiian, Mohawk Japanese. You are invited, encouraged to share in these words that our concentrated attention might help us rediscover our balance, respect, and oneness with nature. Now our minds are one. So the sections from the Thanksgiving Address that are especially pertinent to our opening weekend's jatakas are as follows. The plants. Now we turn in toward the vast fields of plant life. And this is from the Thanksgiving Address. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working wonders. They sustain many life forms. With our minds gathered together, we give thanks and look forward to seeing plant life for many generations to come. Now our minds are one. The food plants. With one mind, we turn to honor and thank all the food plants we harvest from the garden. Since the beginning of time, grains, vegetables, beans, and berries have helped people survive. Many other living things draw strength from them, too. We gather all the plant foods together as one and send them a greeting and thanks. Now our minds are one. The medicine herbs. Now we turn to all the medicine herbs of the world. From the beginning, they were instructed to take away sickness and elevate human consciousness. They are always waiting and ready to heal us. We are happy there are still among us those special few who remember how to use these plants for healing. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the medicines and to the keepers of the medicines. Now our minds are one. And now, especially the trees. We now turn our thoughts to the trees. The earth has many families of trees who have their own instructions and uses. Some provide us with shelter and shade, others with fruit, beauty, and other useful things. <laughs> many people of the world use a tree as a symbol of peace and strength. With one mind, we greet and thank the tree life. Now, our minds are one. Buddhist tradition has its own connections with trees. The Buddha was born under the blossoming sal trees in the Lumbini Gardens. His mother had stopped there on her journey to her ancestral home to give birth, and it was while admiring those blossoming trees that her child, the Prince Siddhartha, was born. Later, when the prince was still just a child, he sat beneath a rose apple tree during a plowing festival to watch his father, the king, nobles, and peasants all plowing the earth together. It was while seated beneath that tree that he spontaneously, for the first time, experienced deep and selfless samadhi. Years later, at a crucial moment in his quest for enlightenment, when near death, as a, result, as a result of severe ascetic practices, the memory of that liberating, spontaneous experience came back to him, recalling that this deep, selfless experience had occurred. While he had been well-clothed and well-fed, he realized that asceticism could not be the true way. He then gave up that self-torturing path, ate a bowl of offered milk rice, and strengthened again by it, sat down beneath the Bodhi tree in fully determined, committed, active present. <clears throat> Finally, at life's end, at 80 years of age, he lay down on his right side beneath twin solid trees and passed into Parinirvana. Trees were with him from birth to death. In the bright, hot Indian climate, the shelter and shade 
that a leafy tree might offer could be a godsend. In the Jatakas, awareness of trees and plants includes recognition of a spiritual life we share with them, as well as an appreciation of their essential kindness to us, all of us, human and non-human alike. Trees, after all, consume carbon dioxide and release oxygen. They might then be considered our primal mothers and fathers. Generously, unselfconsciously, they work through uncounted eons <clears throat> to establish the conditions for human and animal life. Shattering rock into nutrient-rich earth, they literally turn the soil. Is there some unspoken spiritual purpose behind this? Some aspiration? The Talmud tells us that every blade of grass has its angel whispering, grow, grow. A haiku by Shiki captures the aliveness of plants, their dedication to essential fecundity, quietly expressed. The haiku of Shiki's goes like this. <clears throat> In the summer rains, the creeping gourd has reached the trellis work. That plant is alive. Evidence is gathering in scientific and ecological circles that trees and plants are not and never have been mere ornaments decorating our lawns and neighborhoods or even simply sources of food for our bellies or lumber for our homes. Not only are they living beings with all that entails, birth, aging, illness, and death, as well as consciousness, but they live, we are now coming to see in communities. Older trees sheltering younger ones, trees and plants sharing nutrients and information via chemical and fungal pathways. A recent study suggests that trees may even have a pulse or heartbeat, only it is so slow we normally cannot recognize it. Thich Nhat Hanh coined the felicitous phrase, or term rather, interbeing, to clarify that we and all living things interpenetrate. All things <coughs> and each thing a hologram containing all other things. Such thinking actually goes back to the Buddha and the profound Avatamsaka Sutra with its metaphors of towers containing endless towers and especially with its image of the jewel net of Indra. In that stunning image, the universe is seen as one vast linked net of the supreme god, Indra. A jewel in each knot of its mesh reflects all the other jewels. The countless jewels are each contained in each jewel, endlessly. Modern science tells us that our DNA and the DNA of all beings, a moth, a whale, a birch, an oak, and so on, all intersect reflecting each other. Profound as this is, it still limits the mutually interdependent highest non-dual truth. The Zen saying puts it like this, the donkey looks at the well and the well looks at the donkey. There are several jatakas in which the Buddha in a past life is not exactly a tree, but a tree spirit, the divinity or consciousness of a tree the divinity of the life of a tree. Though trees are rooted, and unlike Tolkien's Ents cannot go striding across the landscape, trees, as a number of Jataka's suggest, might still be aware of human good and evil, and might do something about it. In such tales, a tree knows, however a tree knows what it knows, when we humans fall from our deepest potential for wisdom and compassion. Perhaps a tree registers the consequences of human failings as vibrations, or as odd alterations of the normally seasonal sunlight, or in the changed taste or feel of water arising from human-caused pollution. Or a tree might feel the earth shaking with detonations in war, or experience the burning pain of defoliants and poisons released in human conflict. 
When we humans fall from our deepest potential for peace, justice, liberation, and insight, creating real harm instead, why wouldn't a tree as a fellow being, a fellow living being, know it? On this Saha world, as the sutras call it, meaning this bearable or tolerable world, a world where spiritual practice is both necessary and helpful, this is our sorrow and our salvation. The pain of falling from bodhisattva mind and the difficulties this failure causes can rouse our aspiration to go deeper and do better. Imagine a society in which such potential is fulfilled. Sutras say that among the billions of worlds in the endless universe, there are such pure worlds. Deva and bodhisattva worlds where beings naturally function on a high spiritual non-egotistic plane. Lest we think of running there, sutras add <coughs> that beings on such worlds develop, spiritually speaking, much more slowly than here on earth. Here on this difficult earth, sincere efforts toward realization pay off and rather quickly but here too, failure is possible. And when we turn from our potential for wisdom and compassion, it affects everyone and everything like a ripple spreading across the surface of a pond. We'll begin our week-long journey into the Jatakas then with several short tales that dramatize the inner life of trees and, their, and the effects of human thoughts and deeds our first Jataka is number 465, titled the Bada Kunala Jataka, and it goes like this. Once long ago, a king in Benares was seen with the ambition to create a palace that would be a marvel. He thought that his palace would be so special and so would make him so admired that he'd become chief of all the kings of India. The miraculous palace he envisioned would need rather than many columns for its support, only one. But to accomplish this, for that one column, he'd need an amazingly tall, straight, and massive tree. His workmen were ordered to find such a splendid tree. Searching, they found one, a great sal tree in the king's own park. Gaining permission from the king to cut it down, they went to the tree, lit incense and lamps, offered flowers, and tied a cord around the massive trunk. This last bit is reminiscent of the Shinto tree services. They worshipped the tree, and, when they and then they announced, seven days from now, this tree will be cut down by royal command. Let the deities dwelling in it go elsewhere, and may they not blame us for taking their home from them. At that time, the Bodhisattva was the god living in that tree. Hearing their words, he thought, these workmen will cut down my tree and destroy my dwelling. I live only as long as my tree lives. All the young sal trees growing here are my kin even my own children. When my tree falls, many will be crushed and broken. When I die in the shelter and nourishment my tree and I provide is taken from them, those that survive will face hardship and death. I must do all I can to protect them. <clears throat> At midnight, the Bodhisattva entered the king's chamber, filling the room with radiance. The king awoke and was terrified to find a great shining apparition hovering in the air by his bedside, weeping. With hair standing on end, he stammered, Who are you hovering there, bright as the sun, and, and why these flowing tears? Then the godly being, the Bodhisattva, Lord of Trees, answered, In your realm, O king, I am known as the lucky tree. For 60,000 years I have stood untouched and was worshipped, though other trees were cut down and turned into lumber, 
I was never harmed. Considered sacred, I grew unmolested, and my kin and children grew around me. As others have done, you too should worship. There is merit to be won in friendship with trees such as myself, where divinity dwells. The king uh, answered, but you are the greatest and strongest of all trees. I will never find another tree your equal. So I have chosen you to become the column of my marvelous one-column palace. You will be admired and honored. Your fame will spread through the ages. You will achieve a rare destiny. The tree god Bodhisattva said, so you say. But if you now mean to rip my body from me, I ask only that you cut me in pieces. Start at the top, not the bottom, to cut my body limb from limb. First the top, then the middle, and last the root. If you cut me so, my death will not be painful to me. The king said, what? Cut you in pieces rather than cut you whole? That is the painful death reserved for criminals, O oh, lucky tree. Why would you request such an awful and piecemeal death? The lucky tree, divine spirit, answered, My kin and children surround me. I shelter and nourish them. If I fall in one piece, I am so large that many of them will be crushed, broken, or killed. I cannot allow it. I am their parent and protector. I must do all I can to spare them. This is why I choose to be cut piecemeal. The king thought, this is a worthy God, a noble, selfless being. He acts for the good of his kin and for the welfare of others, even though it means greater harm to himself. I cannot go through with my plan to build a miraculous one-column palace. In light of this selflessness, my own aim is shown to be less than worthy. Then the king said, O lucky tree, woodland king, Divine Spirit, your thoughts and aims are noble and greater than my own. In honor of your selflessness, I will free you. You and your kindred may live in peace. I will not build my one column palace. I renounce my own childish vanity. In a great blaze of green and golden light, the king of the tree gods departed. Then the human king, humbled by having seen and spoken with divinity, gave gifts to his people, protected trees, and raised to a spirit of selflessness, good, did good deeds. At death, he entered higher realms. The Buddha, after telling this tale to his Sangha, said, The Tathagata, while no longer abiding within the household life or within the lineage of kings, does not ignore his family, but acts to their good. At that time, Ananda was the human king. The followers of the Buddha were the deities embodied in the young saplings of the salt tree, and I myself was the lucky tree, king of the tree gods. Now the history behind this Jataka is instructive. This tale was told by the Buddha after attempting, not once, but three times to protect his clan, the Shakyas, from destruction by their neighbors, the Lachavis. Though he intervened to pre prevent their slaughter, in the end, he failed. Even he had to accept the ripened karma of his own clan. Having done evil in the distant past, they now found evil karma ripening to them. And so the Shakyas, the Buddha's own birth clan, were decimated nearly to the point of extinction. In light of this issue of evil and its effects, let's look at yet another brief Jataka, number 334 
the Rajavada Jataka. And it goes like this. Once a king wanted to find out where he stood with his people. To do this, he set out from his palace in disguise, asking all he met what they thought about their king. Was he a good king or not? In towns, in the country, people only spoke the king's praises. Then he thought, is there anyone who might honestly speak of my defects? Aha! I will go up into the Himalayas where ascetics and sages dwell. Perhaps they will reveal another truth. So he went into the forest and made his way up the slopes. At that time, the Bodhisattva was an ascetic living in a hermitage on the heights. Born into a Brahmin family when he came of age and had been educated in the arts of his station, he left to dedicate himself fully to the spiritual life. Building a hermitage in the Himalayas and devoting himself to a life of spiritual practice, he realized the faculties of higher awareness and gained the attainments of equanimity, insight, and peace. The king, in his disguise as a commoner, arrived at the Bodhisattva's hermitage and found him eating ripe figs. Have some, said the Bodhisattva. The king ate the offered figs and found them sweet as sugar. He asked, why are these figs so very sweet? The Bodhisattva said they are sweet because our king rules with justice and equity. <clears throat> the king then asked, in the reign of an unjust king, will the figs lose their sweetness? The Bodhisattva said, in the time of an unjust king, oil, honey, molasses, wild roots, berries, and fruits, so yes, figs, all lose sweetness. Not only that, the realm becomes flavorless. The savor of life withdraws. The mind loses joy. But when rulers are just, all things become sweet, full of flavor, and the realm recovers. Thanking the Bodhisattva, the disguised king returned to Benares. Back in the palace, he decided to test the truth of the Bodhisattva's <coughs> words. Then, from that time on, he purposefully ruled unjustly. In time, he returned to the Bodhisattva, who again offered him a fig. He took a bite and immediately spit it out. It was that bitter. It's bitter, he exclaimed. The Bodhisattva said, then the king must be ruling unjustly. When rulers are unjust, even the wild fruits of the forest will know it and become bitter and sour. And he recited this verse. If leaders pursue a selfish path and to base ends guide a vulgar crew, the whole realm will a time of license rue. But if the leader walks a selfless path, the people will injustice eschew, and throughout the reign, throughout the realm, holy peace ensue. The king thought, his words are true. I will now rule justly and make the figs sweet again. He returned home and ruled justly, and the figs regained their original sweetness. After telling this Jataka, the Buddha said, at that time Ananda was the king and I was the ascetic. A good king is moved to find out for himself the truth or falsity of the Bodhisattva's words. Later, when that king is Ananda, the Buddha's own cousin and attendant, he will hear the Buddha confirm his own past experience saying, don't believe my words simply because I say them. Use your own reason and life experience to confirm their truth. Do not rely on respect for me or on your own willingness to believe. Find out the truth or falsehood for <coughs> yourself. So these two brief tales taken together form a kind of prologue. Tomorrow we will look at a longer jataka, number 520, the Ganatindu jataka. 
which combines our themes of the effects of just and unjust human action and the consciousness of trees and takes them further. For now, let's savor the fruit that these two short 2,500-year-old traditional Buddhist tales bear. First, that what we do or do not do individually and as a species affects all other lives and life forms. Of course, this makes sense because human beings have so much power on this earth. What we do does affect every other form of life. And secondly, that trees as conscious living beings can manifest bodhisattvic aspiration and while deeply rooted, might still find ways to act on the deepest impulses for the greater good. Both of these anciently held views offer much potential value to our own present deeply troubled and suffering world. So that's a rather short introduction uh, to our uh, Jataka week. Uh, the way things broke down essentially was uh, this longer Jataka would have been, well, too long to start with, and I'd like to go into uh, greater depth along these themes tomorrow. So I'm holding off that longer Jataka till that time. So we can use our time now to really talk about and explore uh, these two brief Jatakas, uh, which I find really compelling uh, today, especially. So uh, take a comfortable position, uh, and uh, let's see where we might go in exploring what these Jatakas uh, present to us. So you can have microphones. Yes, so we're going to have two microphones, one on each side, so we'll hand them to you when you're going to and there wants to ask a question. And Sunas, if you want to ask a question, uh, just uh, um, raise your virtual hand and we'll know that you're there. 